Today I want to talk a little bit about the factors that influence the strength of acids and bases. So the strength of an acid or a base really depends on how well it dissociates in water or in solution. So if it's in an aqueous solution, whatever the compound is, is dissolved. The ability for it to dissolve or dissociate in solution will determine how strong it is. And strong acids are strong electrolytes and, and strong bases are as well. I, I end up focusing, I like that I sort of say, oh, it's the strength of acids and bases. And then I talk the whole time about the <laughs> about acids, but I think acids are the more complicated one. For bases, a strong base is a hydroxide ion, that OH minus paired with the group one or two metal cations. So we're talking about the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, paired with a hydroxide. Those are all strong, except for beryllium. That's the exception there. And then every other base is a weak base. So it's not really that we have to understand. We just have to kind of know the general trends of things. And the reason for that is because they dissociate really well. So, and there's a lot of factors that go into that as well, but, but that's just kind of the general rule with bases. So with acids though, it gets a little more complicated. Um, and strong acids and strong bases are strong electrolytes. So if you recall the term electrolyte, that means something that dissolves in water and then can conduct electricity because we have ions present. So uh, it puts a lot of ions into solution. We say that it completely dissociates. So um, an example of this would be nitric acid. There are not a lot of things that are classified as strong acids. There's only like six or seven of them, depending on who you ask. And um, so I would recommend knowing those because then if you know those six or seven strong acids, then everything else is a weak acid just by varying degrees. Okay, so nitric acid is one of the strong acids. When it reacts with water, the Arrhenius definition is, well, this thing is going to dissociate. That's that ionic theory of solutions. And we form hydronium, which is really the definition. The Arrhenius definition is when a thing reacts with water and it produces hydronium, then we have an acid. So nitric acid gives me hydronium. And if I'm thinking about this in terms of strength, if I had six molar nitric acid here, then I would assume I have six molar hydronium in solution. It's a complete dissociation. However much I started with here is how much I end up with product wise. And for strong acids, we usually indicate that with an arrow that is just moving in one direction. So um, when we're talking about equilibrium or favoring reactants or products, the products are heavily favored in this reaction because it is so strong. It doesn't like to be this. It wants to be this. Now, weak acids are the exact opposite. So they're weak electrolytes. They don't put a lot of ions into solution. We say they only partially dissociate by how much or what percentage kind of depends on what it is. And there's a number of different factors. But if I take nitrous acid, so this is coming from the nitrite ion as opposed to the nitrate ion. Nitrous acid is a weak acid, and when I react it with water, it's still going to form hydronium. It's an acid, but um, and the nitrite ion, but this reaction is also going in the reverse direction. So this hydronium and the nitrite are also going to form water and my weak acid, nitrous acid here. So when we see these reversible arrows, we know that that indicates that this reaction can go into equilibrium. It is in equilibrium. It will reach an equilibrium point. And what it really means is that the rates of the forward and the reverse reactions can be equal to each other. And so both of these processes are happening um, simultaneously. And if I had six molar nitrous acid, then I could assume that I have significantly less of my hydronium ion. So if I had something like six molar, maybe I'd have one molar hydronium ion, or maybe even less, depending on the percent dissociation, how much this thing splits apart in solution. Now, an interesting feature, and kind of going to the Bronsted-Lowry definition of proton donation, and that we can have these conjugate acid-base pairs, depending on the movement of hydrogen ions, the stronger the acid that we have, the weaker its conjugate base is going to be. So if I have a strong acid like nitric acid here, the conjugate base is going to be what happens when I lose that proton. So that'll be my nitrite nitrate ion. So this nitrate here is, is my conjugate base. And that conjugate base is a very weak conjugate base, which means that um, it's not going to... It's not going to do much in solution, right? It's not going to change the pH by a whole bunch 
Um, and again, we'll get into that in future videos of why and how and what that chemistry is. But for right now, it's just kind of an interesting feature of all of this. Um, and again, we'll get into why a little bit later. Okay, so let's talk about some factors that influence how well these things dissociate in solution. And again, I'm focusing on my acids here because we already talked about bases in kind of general terms. Okay, so percent dissociation really depends on the strength of the bond between the hydrogen, the hydrogen that is being donated into solution, which makes the solution acidic, and the molecule that it's attached to. So we call that hydrogen the acidic hydrogen. And we can identify which one is going to leave the structure based on some information that we get from the Lewis dot structure, based on what we know about the chemistry and the strength of the bonds between things. And there's a couple different factors that go into which one is going to leave. If I have multiple hydrogens, are all of them going to leave? Which ones are more likely to leave than others? And there's a few different factors that go into it. The first factor is ionic radius. That's a big one. So if I have something like HCl or HI, so if I'm kind of going down my binary acids there, which are my hydrogens, my hydrogen halides, um, hydrogen with a halogen, then we remember our ionic radius trends. So if I have my periodic table here, then my general trend for ionic radius is that, um, or my atomic radius in general, and then ionic follows that, is it gets bigger going this way, and we get bigger going down the columns. So my general trend in ionic radius is we get larger going down here towards francium. So if I'm going down a column and I'm comparing, then I'm going down my halogens and I have fluorine, chlorine, right, bromine, iodine. So I'm going down my column here. Iodine is much larger than chlorine is based on the trend, right? It has a greater number of electrons. The ionic or atomic radius is really all about how many electrons it has because the electrons account for all the volume in the structure in an atom. So because I have a larger radius, then we're kind of picturing it like this, right? We have this teeny little hydrogen, and then we have a chlorine, and the difference in the radii is kind of the, um, <laughs> looks like a very surprised frog or something. Um, so the difference in, in between the radii there uh, is really the bond length, right? So this attraction between these things happens because of overlapping orbitals. But if I have more distance between them, so here's my hydrogen. Here's a very surprised frog. <laughs> Picturing the nose. I need to stop myself from drawing. Okay, so if we compare these two, it's going to be easier to split these apart because the nuclei are further apart already, right? So this guy, closer together, they're held more tightly bound. These guys further apart, easier to split them apart. So if I was saying which one is going to be the stronger acid, the stronger acid comes from the greater ionic radius. So hydrogen I iodine here, or hydroiodic acid, is going to be my stronger acid. So uh, if we're going to kind of combine that together, the larger the radius, then the stronger the acid. Which feels a little bit counterintuitive, but it really has to do with the strength of the bond, right? The larger the radius, then the weaker the bond. And the weaker the bond, the stronger the acid. And again, that feels a little bit counterintuitive, but if that hydrogen is not held on very tightly, then it can go into solution more. And if it goes into solution more, then I have more acidic character because that hydrogen in solution defines an acid. Now, electronegativity also comes to play, less so with the binary acids, so all of those hydrogen halides. But if I have acidic character in other types of molecules, so let's take methanol, for example. So here's methanol with my alcohol group here, this hydroxyl and OH that's attached to a hydrocarbon. Now you can see I have multiple hydrogens here. And if I asked you which one is the acidic hydrogen on here, then we'd have to look at each of these bonds individually. And we'd have to know something about their electronegativities. Well, we know that hydrogen's about 2.2, carbon's about 2.5, 5, depending on the scale. And so you know that this bond is nonpolar. But everything else in here, this bond is polar, this bond is polar. So nonpolar means an equal sharing of electrons. 
So if I'm equally sharing these, then these hydrogens are pretty happy where they are. Now this bond, if we put our dipole on it, the net dipole, of course, is going to go up through the oxygen somewhere. But for this bond in particular, that oxygen is an electron hog. All these electrons are hanging out over here in terms of the density. That leaves this hydrogen freer to leave. So this is my acidic hydrogen. If I'm identifying my acidic hydrogen, it's this guy. And it's that guy because of this polar bond. These guys are all nonpolar. These hydrogens don't want to leave. But this acidic hydrogen wants to leave because this oxygen is hogging all of the electrons. So it's going to go into solution. Now if I take ammonium, ammonium also acts like an acid because it can donate a hydrogen. So one of these, each of these hydrogens is kind of the same bond. These are all polar bonds, but we're all kind of pulling in the same direction. So this is really a non-polar molecule. And I'm still going to lose one of these things, but it doesn't really matter which one I lose. It's not easy to identify which is my acidic hydrogen. I'm going to lose one of them. Um, and they'll probably like rock, paper, scissors to leave. That's sort of the situation there. So this is my stronger acid because this one is more readily going to leave. Whereas these guys, even though these are polar bonds, the nonpolar structure makes this hydrogen harder to leave, even though it still is going to. They're both acidic. They're both going to donate hydrogens into solution. But because of the polarity of the structure, because of the shape of these things, because of the way that they're oriented, then it's going to be harder for one to lose the hydrogen, which makes it less acidic, this one more acidic. Okay, so ionic radius and electronegativity play into it. Now with oxy acids or oxo acids, those are my acids that have an oxygen in them, hence the name, right? So um, oxy acids have oxygen. They're also called oxo oxy acids. You'll see it both ways. And they tend to have this structure that looks like this, where we have an oxygen and then we have something attached to it. And this something can be attached to other things, but this Y is kind of the generalized other thing that's in there. So an example of that would be something like um, that nitric acid that I was talking about before. HNO3 is an oxy acid, where my Y would be my nitrogen, just for that context there. Now there's a couple factors that go into the strength of oxy acids or oxo acids. The first is the electronegativity of that Y. And again, I'm not talking about yttrium here. I'm talking about whatever that thing is that's attached to the oxygen. The acidic hydrogen here is going to be the one that's attached to the oxygen. Then that oxygen is going to be attached to the Y. So if I look at the difference between these two, then I have this kind of HOCl, uh, HOI. And we looked at chlorine and iodine before with ionic radius. But when we're looking at these guys, the stronger the electronegativity, so the greater the N, the more hungry that Y is, in this case chlorine or iodine, the more hungry it is for electrons. So it's pulling on all these electrons, right? So we're pulling on electrons, we're pulling on electrons. The density of all the electrons is hanging out over here. That allows this hydrogen to leave, that acidic hydrogen. Whereas this one is less electronegative. So it's pulling away a little bit, but it has less of a pull than this guy. This guy, more of a pull. Greater the electronegativity, then the more acidic this thing is going to be. So we already know that oxygen is an electron hog. So it's really what else is there. If there's another electron hog there, the greater the electronegativity kind of of that generalized Y and the stronger the acid, okay? The other factor with oxy acids is how many oxygens there are. So I only had one oxygen in these examples up here, but if I look at these, the greater the number of oxygens, the more electron hogs I have. So I'm gonna have an increasing acidic strength going this way. The more oxygens that are pulling on that electron density, the easier it is for that hydrogen to lose. So we have kind of increasing strength, the more oxygens I have. And that really goes back to electronegativity as well. So these factors kind of go lead one into the other. And the more density I have of electrons here, then the easier it is for that hydrogen to leave. Okay, so that's a little bit about the factors that influence the strength of acids. And we talked a little bit about bases as well. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, I'll talk to you again soon.